What's happening, everybody? It's Kira and Ben back again. Of course, we're in spooky season, so we are covering some haunted house movies this week. Kicking it off, we are covering House from 1985. Now, Ben, this was suggested by you, so tell me your history with the film. So uh, when I was younger, it came out, and all my friends had seen it, and I didn't see it. And it was disappointing for me because I wanted to see it since everybody else in the neighborhood had seen it was talking about it. And I was like, oh. So eventually I did end up seeing it, and um, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it um, it was definitely not what I was expecting um, when we talked about it, and then I like read the description, and then obviously I watched it. Very interesting, and I liked that it was kind of silly. Did you find that? Oh, 100%. It, it, for me, it reminded me of kind of like, of like the Evil Dead kind of uh, comedy-ish horror yeah like i think there was a lot of that like campiness especially with like the um ghosts and like demons in the house so i did really appreciate that so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the film um house 1985 is about a war vet who is now a horror writer so he was in vietnam war and now he's a horror writer um very successful um he has divorced from his actress wife and his aunt has just committed suicide in the house that um, she raised him in. We find that out um, after we find out that his mother has died and that the aunt has raised him. So he's kind of having some writer's block writing his memoir about the Vietnam War. And so he moves back into the house and he starts seeing things. He starts um, experiencing the ghosts. One thing that I didn't realize was how touching and sad this movie was going to be um so we see that when when the movie opens um he uh, our main protagonist roger is already separated um from his wife and we see that um he's like trying to pretend like he's like having fun like i love that scene where he like turns up the music because like he thinks she's calling and then she does call and he's like pretending to have poker night with the boys i was like oh my god like you're trying so hard but we find out through a flashback of the house that um, they actually had a child together who went missing. Um, They thought he thought he saw him go into the pool. Um, He also saw a car speed away. Um, They couldn't, they never found the body. And to me, this is what leads to the demise of his uh, marriage. What did, what did you think? Oh, a hundred percent. And I have never personally experienced a tragic loss like that, but I've seen and heard of people where the children have gone and it separates the parents from each other. And they end up getting divorced. Oh, absolutely. I mean, same as you. I don't have any children, so I've never lost a child. Um, But I can only imagine like the stress that it may feel and like the parents start blaming each other because like they only care about their child. So very, very interesting. And that was something that was really unexpected for me in the film. I wasn't really expecting to see that. Um, Something else I wasn't expecting to see in the film was Norm from Cheers. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, George went. Yep. yep, Yeah. Yeah. When he came up as the neighbor, I was like dying. I was just like, (laughs) no, I thought that was so funny. So to me, that kind of also set like a silliness tone of the film because I've only known him as a comedy actor. I don't know if you felt the same, but. Well, no, the funny thing is uh, a few years ago, I went to the Rhode Island Comic Con and he was there and I actually got to speak with him. And I was like, what are you doing at a Comic Con? (laughs) And he's like, he's like a house and I went oh my god I totally forgot you were in house and me and him got a good little laugh out of that you know that's so funny it yeah it's kind of funny yeah so he plays like the supporting character um I would consider him like a very nosy neighbor he's like trying to like push his way into Roger's life being like I mean one of the funniest parts is when he's introducing himself and he's like oh yeah the woman that used to live here she was crazy she was cynical she was evil and then Roger's like she was my aunt uh, and then Norm goes, oh, she had a heart of gold. Love <laughs> loved the Wonderful lady. <laughs> Wonderful. I thought that was so funny. I was like, oh, my God. People are just so, like, predictable at every turn. Um, so now Roger is experiencing um, some horrors of the house. He is seeing the ghosts. He is seeing these very fantastical kind of demons and creatures. Um, what I thought was so funny. So, okay. So obviously we know that Roger is a Vietnam war vet. We see this in flashbacks. We see him trying to write his memoir about this. And then we also see him like rushing to pack this bag. And in no point in when he is rushing to pack this bag, do we see him pack all his war like uniform and like clothes. And then when he's like hunting these demons, he's like in his like army green jacket and like shirt. He's got his gun. And I was like, when did you have time to do this? Also, like, if you're struggling with, like, the memories of the war as much as, like, 
this movie is making us believe you are like why are you donning that attire like I think and we're gonna get into this later when we talk about the analysis of the film but I do believe this film is about overcoming PTSD yes yes I believe so too Uh, so another funny thing about this movie is it does have some actors in it that you're gonna end up recognizing uh, William Cat, who was in The Greatest American Hero I was telling you about. It yeah. used to be a very popular television show in the uh, early 80s. And then uh, there's um, Richard Mall, who was Bull from mm-hmm. um, Night Court. So that does have people that you're going to go, oh, I know that person. Oh, I know that person. Yeah. So for me, I've never seen either of those shows, so I did not know who these people were. And my gray hair just got grayer. <laughs> I just want you to know that, people. I'm like, oh, yep, okay. <laughs> I know that they just did a remake of Night Court. They, like, revamped it, and there's, like, a new season out. Yes, it has um, John Larroquette, and it has the girl that played Bernadette from um, The Big Bang Theory in it. It's actually pretty funny. Is it? I, I watched a couple episodes, and uh, it, w- it was nice. That's cool. I mean, I... Again, I have not seen it. Did not know about Night Court till we were talking about this. Um, yes. So back to the film. So uh, Roger is dealing with all the horrors of the house. He's like trying to catch the ghosts on camera. He enlists the help of his neighbor, Norm, um, to try to. I thought that scene was so funny. And then we see Roger vanish and Norm's just like drinking whiskey, like trying to deal with all the things that he's seen. What I found most interesting was the use of art in this film, similar to when we were talking about Midsummer. Um, for those who haven't listened, uh, please listen to the Midsummer episode. But the art in the Midsummer film uh, pushed and really um, drove the story. And I think the aunt's paintings in, di- in this did the same because it's kind of like they were like these very uh, kooky sort of graphic horror, realistic paintings. And everyone's like, oh, these are grotesque. These are crazy. And as Roger's studying one of the paintings, he actually notices his son in the mirror, which kind of confirms that his son was always at the house, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I thought so, too, because like the very opening scene, it's the delivery boy. Yeah. And he goes up the stairs because no one's answering. And when he turns around and looks at the painting, he goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> what the hell is this? And, yeah. And then, you know, he ends up finding the lady uh, hung. But um, yeah, the, a lot of artwork in this like depicts what's going on. Yeah, which I think is really cool. I think it's a good tactic um, that filmmakers can use. I think it really drives the story in a way that's interesting. And it kind of cuts out a lot of that exposition dialogue that can make that can weigh down a film, I feel like. And really like when you there's too much exposition exposition in a film, I feel like it bogs it down and it kind of takes you away from it. Also, people just don't talk in exposition. Like that's just not it's just not normal. So I like when filmmakers uh, utilize other tools um, to pu- to propel a story. So um, that was something that was interesting and I felt like it tied into an episode that we had done previously. Um, so as Roger is fighting these demons, he does keep having these war flashbacks and as he is flashing back, he is really focused on this one guy that he kind of went through it with um, whose name is Ben. And yeah. he's kind of like the gruffer, sort of like no nonsense, I'm here to kill and fight sort of war um war vet that you hear about and we kind of see their friendship through these flashbacks and how they're sort of like bonding and going on these trips together um and the climax i believe is when we find out that roger ben is injured in the field and he is about to die and we see that he's begging roger to take his life and roger is unable to and now ben holds all this resentment for him because he is then um captured by the enemy and dragged off and that's that the last that we see of him in his living form. And I think this is Roger's core memory and this is Roger's core like PTSD sort of like catalyst. And I think that's very like unsubtle when we see Ben come back as like zombie war hero and is kind of like, I've been terrorizing you. I've stolen your son. Like I kidnapped him. Like you, I'm going, you're going to kill yourself because you couldn't kill me. Like I thought that was like, so Obviously, this is a metaphor for Roger dealing with his PTSD, trying through the book and then in the form of the haunted house. And I like this because I think when you use tactics like a haunted house, and we're going to cover this in our secondary film, House from 1977, I think it's really interesting um, because in a haunted house, all your main anxieties can come out, right? Like you're supposed to be in a place that you feel safe. This is your home. And then you're being terrorized in your own home. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And um. You know, I, I remember we were watching Parasite, mm-hmm. and uh, they were talking about the child. Remember the child did artwork, and yeah. uh, the lady said that, you know, a lot of expressionism of trauma and things like that come through art. So I thought, like, you know, 
the paintings, the books, everything like was his way of dealing with the, um, the PTSD, you know, and until it became too overwhelming. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's kind of a crazy message that like, oh, once you get over your PTSD, like you can do it alone and you can get through it alone. And like, then you'll get everything back that you wanted. Like we see at the end when he's like reunited with his son, he defeats Ben, he, um, his ex-wife comes back. They're like, a, like it's implied that they become a family again because her son is back. Um, and I thought that was kind of crazy because I think in real life, when you're dealing with things like this, you do have to have a support system that you lean on. I think it's very sort of regressive to say that you have to go through things alone. And I think that is a very 80s mindset. Yeah. So to me, that that felt a little icky. But obviously, 85, right. we're in 2023 now. Like, obviously, emotional growth and things have changed. But with that being said, it was still an interesting movie. Now, was I overly spooked or jump scared by this? No. Were no. you? No, no, it wasn't a jump scare movie. Uh, although when the hands came out of the um, the mirror, when he broke the mm. mirror, that kind of jumped me a little bit. I would admit that because I wasn't expecting the hands to just come yeah. running out and grabbing him. But um, no, I totally see what you're saying about like, you know, the mindset, like, because I grew up in the 80s and like in the 70s and 80s. And whenever I hurt myself or anything happened, you know, the phrase was suck it up and be a man. Yeah. yeah. And I think that is such a detrimental phrase. And I think it, it causes a lot of harm. And I think now we are in an era of where we're trying to undo a lot of that harm. We're trying to have men be able to speak on their emotions because I think that is so important. I mean, yes, I think the constructs of what is defined as manliness or what makes you a man is not what is true because at the end of the day, we're all humans. And I do believe that that is a system that has been put in place by men, men upheld by men, and now men suffer because of it. But they, but no one can break the cycle. So it's like I see. I think now when we see people being more open, more emotional, more being able to talk about their feelings, I think this is such a huge breakthrough because everyone needs that support. And I think that was what was missing from this film is that support. Yeah, I think so too. Because you think um, the stereotypical um, man how people look at men is is centuries old i mean you know men go off the war men do this men are the breadwinners men is this men is that and it's only recently like only in the last what less than 100 years that you know that's been a step back and people are like no everybody's equal everybody's going to do the right thing everybody's going to like try and support the house try and try and make a family try and like support each other and um it's just you know it's just how it's been for centuries so it's you know it takes a lot to get over no, absolutely. But I mean, by the, by the reverse of that, I would say as well is that women did not have rights. Women could not property. Women could not own their own money. Women didn't even have claim to their own children. Everything defaulted to the man. So I think with that being in place, you have to have that liberation of the woman to be able to have that partnership. And I think we're seeing that more now. I mean, I was hanging out with my friend the other day and we were talking and we were saying and, and She's um she's amazing. She's one of my best friends, Um, but she's gone through a very tough breakup and now she's reentering the dating scene. And we were talking and she goes, you know, what's crazy to me is that I have been on my own now for about a year and a half and I am I am making my own money. I am living on my own. I care for myself. I care for my dog. I have X, Y and Z. And she goes, it's really disheartening when men come and talk to me and they just like assume that I need them for their money. She's like, I've never been with a man that I've made less than. And I was like, preach girl, like you work so hard. So I think to see that now is so important and it makes me so proud. It gives her a sense of like freedom. I, and I think that is a very universal for like women everywhere. Like we're seeing the rise of a stronger woman because women can now take care of themselves. Yes, we don't women don't need men the way that men think they need them. Women need a partner. Women need someone who's emotionally open or emotionally available, someone who will support them, listen to them. It's not about providing like it has been in the past where women when where women couldn't make their own money. Yeah. Have you ever um, seen six the musical? I've seen nine the musical. Uh, Six (laughs) six, the musical is uh, about the six wives of Henry the eighth. Oh, that sounds interesting. It's it's really good. And uh, one of the songs in it is from. Anna of Cleves. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's the the one that he sent out feelers for people to um, bring back who he would choose as his next queen. And they did portraits. And um, when they did the portraits, he loved her portrait. But when she came, he didn't think she looked anything like her portrait. And he wasn't in love with her. And he basically went to her and said, you know, look, 
I don't want to be with you. Uh, here's your options. You can either A, have your head chopped off, or B, let me put you up in a castle, let me give you a stipend, and you can come to court whenever you want and run your life. So basically, Anne of Cleves was like this independent woman after that like had her own castle, lived by herself, would come into court whenever she wanted to, did whatever she wanted to, and um, it was like, you know, for me, I thought that was very awesome because like it showed like you know, she was never underestimate what someone can do, like a woman, a man, um, if if given the opportunities. I mean, was she given the opportunity or was she just objectified and then deemed ugly? Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I totally understand what you're I totally, yeah. totally get it. But to me, like if I if someone fell in love with me based on my looks from a photo and then I come to them in person and they're like, wow, you're fucking hideous. I'm actually just going to give you your money so you can be free and independent. I'd be like, okay, thank you. You're a piece of shit. But also I am beautiful. Yeah, like- no, no, she does. Think she, <laughs> she does think she's beautiful. If you, Good. if you watch the musical, like it's basically, she says, you know, I, I'm being told this by this fat old, yeah. you know, jerk. And she's like, I, I'm, that's not who I am. So it's actually a really good musical if you get a chance to watch it. I'll watch it. Um, Yeah, I'll watch it. That's insane to me. Um, But yeah, hey, the first independent woman was independent because she was ugly. Like, <laughs> preach, I guess. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, All right, so back to <laughs> So as Roger's fighting, we see in the climactic scene that he is swimming. He's jumping into this like abyss trying to find his son he goes through the mirror he's jumping into the abyss trying to find his son and when he is there he's in the water because we see that his son gets pulled through the water in the beginning and then as he's swimming through the water it turns into a a stream in vietnam and he sees his son um in a cage so to me this is like his main point of getting through his PTSD and breaking that cycle within himself so then he is able to rescue his son and as they reach what they could consider safe because they are out of this like dreamlike area of the house and they're back into the actual house um, that is when we have the skeleton of Ben appear and what I think is so interesting is that with this it's like Roger has fought and fought and fought and he's now found what what his source of happiness is what he's looking for and then he still has to fight again, which I think shows that like trauma comes in cycles and it is not linear, which I appreciate because I, I mean, I don't know if that was the point of the film. Obviously, they have to have a final battle. But I thought that was really interesting, especially when we see Roger struggling and fighting with Ben. And then Ben tries to like cut him with um with his like knife and it doesn't harm Roger. And then Roger's like, oh, you actually can't hurt me you're actually just in my head. Like, this is actually something I can battle. And I think when we see that, obviously it's great that we have Roger come to this realization on his own. He is then able to defeat Ben, save his son, live happily ever after. But obviously, like, that is not something, that is not a realistic conclusion that you can come to by yourself when you're dealing with these emotional issues, I believe. Yeah, I thought, like, okay, so I thought the part where he goes through the mirror and he goes and he finds his son in this cage. I thought that was that was him going into his own mind, digging deep into himself and unlocking what was causing him all these problems and then bringing it to the surface and then facing it on the on the for, on the surface in reality time instead of having it oppressed. I thought oh. it was like him releasing that oppression. Absolutely, absolutely. I totally see that. And with releasing that oppression, finding what he's looking for, that's how he's able to overcome his PTSD. Right. Saying you can't hurt me no more. Yeah, you can't hurt me no more. Like you are in my m- mind. This is fake. You can't hurt me. And then he burns the house down. Yep. <laughs> Even though it's fake, he burns the house down. And which I thought was so funny. So the logic of this film and the science of this film makes no sense. Yeah, We can't say that it does because we have been obviously in army gear, unable to harm Roger, but then Roger is able to take the grenade from Ben and then blow him up. But then even though it it should just, if the logic is that these magical creatures can only harm these magical things, it should just harm Ben, right? Yeah. It does not. It blows up the whole house. It sets the whole house on fire. So I, I looked at the house as a metaphor. I thought the house wasn't actually a house. I thought it was the four walls of his mind and Absolutely. then when he burns down he's burning down his mind the, yeah the, the the walls he put up to block out this memory so that's what i looked at oh of course i mean this movie is 
truly about overcoming PTSD at its core. This is what it is. It is how do you deal with the traumas in your life? Right. Um, You burn them down. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. you burn them down. And, you know, even the wife, um, like when they show her, she's at this uh, award ceremony and everything. And, like, she's kind of like, you know, you could tell she wants to still have a connection with him. And, um, you know, when she lets him go, she's definitely worried about him and everything. But you can see, like, that there's men trying to force themselves upon her. And you can see, like, the look on her eyes, like, when she rolls her eyes at this one guy that's like, you know, take a picture with me, hold me. You know, and it's like, you know, it kind of, for me, it was like looking at, like, how people would stereotype a female actress back then. You know, like, you know, it had to be next to a man, couldn't be by yourself. You know, you, you can't be the lead. You know, the lead has to be the guy, and the guy has to be the one. You know, so for me, it felt like that was kind of like, a little barrier thing there too. Yeah, a little bit. And what I liked about that was like, she obviously, like, like you said, she wanted that connection with him. And obviously they were still like yearning for each other Um, because you see her like calling him being like, Oh, I lost. Like, I'm like, I'm distraught about it. And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to like live my own life. And you can see that they're hurt in their own ways and they're dealing with it in their own ways. And from everything that I've known of like women and men in relationships, I feel like that is very, true and it goes back to men not being able to express their emotions in the way that they want like she's obviously there reaching out to him talking to him being like hey like trying to build this like connection and he's like oh like I'm out with my boy like lying obviously but like oh I'm out with my boys like I'm fine like I'm doing this like I can't hear you like trying to put on this like facade of like I am the strong man like you left but I am the strong man where it's like they're both hurting and if they just opened up and talked about that hurt, I don't think that divorce would be would have happened. Now, I have a question. When the monster takes the form of her and he kills the monster, do you feel that that was his inner view of his wife, how he portrayed her throughout this whole situation, that she was the monster? And by killing that monster, he actually came to realization that she was a beautiful person that he actually truly loved? So I would say yes. But I don't believe so because of the remorse that he felt when the monster turned back into the form of his wife. So we see the monster comes in three forms. First the wife, then the monster, then the wife again. And this is as a trick to make him think that he's actually killed the real version. Right. So I believe that this was like a trick and what what it was doing. And when we see that remorse of him being like, oh, my God, I killed my wife. Like, oh, my God, I love this person and I murdered her. Like and I think when we see that remorse, I don't think, I don't think he had resentment towards her. I think any resentment he had was because he was just mad at himself of, of the situation. Right. Right. Not resentment towards her. I meant like, like resentment towards how he treated her. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How he, um, how he like portrayed her. Like, I'm sure he like, like during his own, because his mind was kind of warped and twisted that this would put him over the edge and then he would make her out to be the bad person. Right. And I think, and I think like, we see this like in movies a lot. Um, there was just a movie I was thinking about and I, I can't remember it now, but I'll, it will come back to me where they use the same tactic of the person that um, is your ma- one of your sources of trauma attacking you in a monster form and then you killing that and then being like remorseful that you actually killed the person. Um, obviously, it was just a monster this whole time. Um, but yeah, I do believe like I don't believe he would have he didn't obviously didn't want to kill his wife. No, no, no. I think that was more of a metaphor. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. this whole movie is yeah, a metaphor. Very metaphoric. <laughs> yes, very metaphoric. That's what I liked about it because it was like like everything had a meaning. Like everything like everything that happened in this movie, there was a meaning behind it. Like the nosy neighbor you know, is this someone that wants to intervene and try and be helpful, but doesn't know how, but doesn't know how. And like, you know, he calls the wife and he, he's, uh, he's, he's generally concerned about this person, you know, but I didn't think, I didn't think it was more like a real person. I didn't think Norm was a real person. I thought that, um, that character was more of a catalyst towards him seeking his own way of helping himself. And I can see that, but at the same point, like he kind of rebuffs Norm in the beginning. And I think that's like how, when you're so sad and in your own head and dealing with your own things, you're unable to see the help of the people around you. And that's like, cause he's like, Oh, like let's have dinner. Let's do this. Let's do that. And he's kind of like, no, no, no. Until he has to like kind of mislead him into coming into the house and being like, Oh, I need you. you let's watch a movie. And then he's actually like, Oh, you're going to help me catch a demon. Yeah. No, I totally get like being a, an alcoholic and um, being on my butt. Uh, I had many people who tried to lift me up. Many people came to me 
and we're like, but I was so stuck in my own self pity and wallowing in my own like uh, addiction that I didn't want it. I didn't think I needed it. And I didn't see it for what it was. I just viewed them as in- interlopers into my my oblivion. Right. Absolutely. And I think and I think this is really like brought about brought about with the relationship between Roger and Norm. Yeah. And I totally see that because like even when we're in our own heads, even when we're trying to deal with something, we can't. We can't get out of that mindset, I don't believe. And I think we ha- as as much as like we can lean on others at the end of the day, like you have to be the one to like lift yourself up. Like obviously that's kind of going against what I've been saying earlier, but it's not really like you can lean on others and you can talk to others and you can process things with others and you can have the support of others. But at the end of the day, you live within your own own world, with o- your own reality. Oh, yeah. And you have to you have to help your to have others help you, you have to help yourself and you have to be open to it. Yeah. It's like Jerry Maguire. Help me help you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> help me to help you. Yeah. And, and I think we see that. And I think, and I think that we only really see that with his relationship with Norm. And then we see it with the distance between his ex-wife. I mean, everyone else is kind of just trying to get things from him. And that's why I think he feels so isolated. We see that with the real estate agent. And we also see it with his like editor or like agent yeah. publisher. I don't know. Um, but we kind of see them being like, okay, like you need to push this book, you need to push this book. And then we see it with the real estate agent, like, oh, you should sell this house and fix it up and like do this. And he's like, oh, no, I'm going to like live here. And you can see when the real estate agent kind of like steps back from that. And he's like, oh, you're going to live here? Like in the house that your aunt killed herself in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with these creepy paintings? I think, you know, what it is is like when you are, when you are doing better, when you're trying to fix yourself, a lot of times people are so used to you screwing up that they don't believe you okay yeah and i think that's what that was kind of getting at it was like you know he, he was like i'm gonna write a book and he's like no you're not you yeah. know and he's like no i really am but like he didn't believe him and then the real estate agent's like you know sell the house he's like yo i don't want to sell the house i want to live here and he's like i want to live here so it's like you know that for me was like another stereotype of you know you're not overcoming nothing because that's not what you want to do but you know in his mind he really did want to overcome yeah, absolutely. And we and we see that desire to overcome um, when he is fighting for first. So there's another woman in the picture. It is his neighbor across the street who I thought was so funny. Yeah. OK, let's talk about this woman for a second, because I don't know, like talk about when we're talking about people using other people like she was so funny. So she's very like flirtatious with him, like, oh, I'm so pretty. Oh, like you're the new guy. Like, very flirtatious. Oh, your aunt used to let me swim in her pool. Like, I know when a man wants to have fun, like, let's have fun. And kind of, like, misleads him. And then she's like, okay, I'm going out. Babysit my kid. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> the poor kids got, like, the, you know, the monster hand on them and, yeah. like, running around. And But, like, you know, it was just, it was so, like, funny. I was laughing at that, too. I thought that was great. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But I also think, like, having him have that child in the house kind of helped him fight for his son because he had to fight for this one kid that he hadn't done in so long and I think that kind of gave him more of a sense of purpose we see him fighting for the kid and then we see him giving him a bath and we see him being very like tender and like loving and very like fatherly and then after that we see the reappearance of his missing son so I think that was like a very interesting kind of like um tactic to use because you can see that he wants that that person is still in him which is another thing about PTSD that that you are still in there is just you have to allow yourself to come back out and like you said burn down the walls of that trauma oh yeah 100 percent. like it's kind of funny uh people see me now and they didn't know me then so they view me in a certain way but when we see people that knew me then it's like you know like when we're at the book signing and people were talking to me you know and you're like oh you know because like I'm not the person I was but I am the person I was it's like I I rev- I claimed myself as that possible? absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. and I think and I think there are many versions of ourselves yeah. and I mean just like the seasons we are always growing we are always changing but that doesn't mean that our roots aren't there like I really do believe that like every version of us still exists within us yeah. but we are learning and growing and becoming better people every day and I feel like if you're not growing and learning and becoming a better person every day like what's what's the point of life right yeah. Everyone talks about this, like, this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, you guys, but I got a lot to say. So (laughs) um, what is the meaning of life, right? Everyone is searching for this. I struggle with this all the time. Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? But I do know, like, at the end of the day, something that I can do is that I can be 
I can better myself and I can work on myself because that's all I can do. And if I'm a better person, then I can be a better person to other people. And then that's what the what, what life is. It's about making connections with other people. It's about sharing love. It's about sharing compassion. It's about sharing the shared human experience because if we don't have that, then we are all just like islands, stars all alone. But we have this collective experience. We have this human experience that really does bind us in a way that we in a way that is so true and we just see all the differences of this like reality that pull us apart which is not true does that make sense yeah yeah i totally got that i mean it was very um very deep but yeah i did get it but like i but like i think and i think that like this movie like we can see that because we can see we see norm trying to make the connection with roger we see the wife trying to make the connection with roger and we see roger just stuck in this place holding on to ben and how he couldn't kill him yeah. and how and how he holds this guilt and how he holds all of this within himself. So I do. I mean, honestly, guys, like, is it a silly, fun movie? Absolutely. Yes. But I think if you peel back the surface layer of what it's telling you, you get a not like a I'm, I'm not going to say it's rich. I can't I can't speak to that. It's, it is a, a, a silly horror movie. But like it, it, it does have this great ethos about it about the human condition yes 100 percent, and that's like one of the reasons i suggested it because it, it's a very good movie with a lot of metaphors that opens up your mind to like dealing with certain things absolutely and i think like especially like like dealing with ptsd like dealing with addiction there are a lot of similarities within that so i feel like that's something that you can really pull from i mean everyone pulls something different from a film but films are universal because they touch all of us in a certain way right yes Art, music, films, literature, all of this is so important. It always makes me think of that um, quote from Dead Poet Society that when Robin Williams is, he's, he's saying, he's like, beauty, love, art, poetry, these are the things that matter because this is what binds us. Like, yes, we. I was just talking about how people do feel like they are alone and they are isolated and they are just stars um, in the sky with no connection. But this is what connects us, This this heart, this human connection. We all feel things. Everyone has a heart. Everyone feels something. No, whether or not you want to admit that to yourself, whether or not you want to express that to others, everyone feels something, right? And I think that's why there's so much beauty in connection. I don't know. I, be- I believe that like people should be more open with their emotions. I don't believe people should play games with their emotions. Obviously, is it scary to be vulnerable? A hundred percent. Like it is. That is one of the hardest things to do. And we see that in this film, Roger trying to become vulnerable with other people. But first, he has to be vulnerable with himself. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's like any relationship. When you first get out, you don't let everything known in that relationship. Um, then gradually over time, the person gets to know you. You get to know person. But your biggest fear when you break up is that person's going to betray all your your trust and, and hurt you. And you Of know, course. And that's, that's one of the things that people deal with on a, you know, in, in relationships is, you know, when they break up, the, the person doesn't want to be broken up with because they don't want the person to go. But they also don't want all the knowledge of themselves out there absolutely and speaking of relationships i okay so yeah i totally agree with that and that what you just said reminds me one of my favorite monologues in in like in recent memory um is the movie super great no is it beautiful and stylish absolutely i am speaking of call me by your name for those of you who have seen it obviously like the, it is problematic um And it does have its issues. I have not read the book. I've only seen the movie. So yell at me in the comments if it's different. But I think that it there it talks a lot about connection and love. And there's a there's a scene between Michael Stahlberg and Timothy Chalamet. Michael Stahlberg plays his father. Timothy Chalamet, his son. He has just gone through this heartbreak of losing um, Oliver. And he is talking to his dad and his dad is saying, you know, what you have is so pure and so true. And you need to hold on to that. And he says, he goes, we rip out so much of ourselves to rid ourselves of feeling bad. But, but, but by doing that, we bankrupt ourselves and we are unable to feel anything by the time that we're older. And he's like, and when you do that, that's when you become an empty shell of a person. So even though it's painful, you have to go through that pain to still maintain that love. And I think, I think about this quote literally all the time. I would say, guys, like, Please, like, don't you don't have to watch the movie, but this, like, to me is something that matters so, so much. And I think it really ties in to everything that we're talking about. We see Roger ripping out parts of himself 
to not deal with his PTSD, to de- not deal with the loss of his son, to not deal with the disintegration of his marriage. And then he, everything has to come to a head for him to actually fight it. And in this movie, it is in the form of a haunted house. Yes. But obviously, um, this was a very long rant, you guys. So thank you for listening. Um, I would absolutely um, recommend this movie. It's a silly fun time. Like you said, there are a lot of Evil Dead vibes with that kind of campiness of the creatures, that sort of practical effects, which I love. I love a practical effect. So I love to see that. But yeah, I watched it on Prime. I don't know how you watched Prime it. Prime video. Yeah. So if you guys have Prime, check it out. It is there. Um uh, a tight 90, which I love. You know me. I love a tight 90. Um, we've been doing a lot of really long movies, yeah. so it feels good to just kind of get in and get out. But yeah, I would recommend it. It, it. It's good. It's fun. It's silly. But if you peel back that silliness, I think there is a lot that you can unpack. Oh, 100%. Like I said, I, I liked it a lot. And I would like to say, you know, a shout out to all the countries that are listening to us. Um, we're still doing very well in India, Ghana, Nigeria. We're starting to pick up in the United States. Thank you, people. Uh, we're in New Hampshire's own, by the way. We're in New Hampshire's own podcast. We're, for, we're here in New Hampshire, so pick up New Hampshire. Yeah, seriously, guys. Thank you for everyone who supports us, listens to us. Um, we have been doing some live shows, so for those of you who have been able to come and like um, support us in person, that also means a lot. Um, we know a lot of you guys are also overseas, but listening, downloading, that supports us as well. We love we love doing this. We love we love this content. We we have I have fun with it. I know Ben has fun with it. And if, if we didn't have this podcast, we would just be screaming into the void all our opinions. Yep. Yep. So this is a way that we can connect with you guys. And as you know, this episode is all about connections. So it, re- it really means the world to us. I can't thank you guys enough. So thank you. Keep listening. Keep writing in. Um, obviously, we're going to do like a few more spooky movies. And then, you know, we're into Thanksgiving and we're into the fall and we're, then we're into winter. And, you know, I don't know. So many, so many movies to cover in so little time. Yep, yep. Oppenheimer is coming out, and Bobby came out. So there's a bunch of stuff like that we can do after the spooky season. So oh, you haven't, you didn't see them in theaters? No, 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 I didn't. Yeah. I don't go to the movies much. I know you don't. I, this is <laughs> this is this is where we differ. Um, I saw both of them in theaters. I I have seen both of those. I would I would talk about both of them. Barbenheimer. I don't know. Okay, that, <laughs> we can talk about that off camera. But thank you guys for listening again. It's Kira and Ben from What's Happening.